Good morning, and welcome to the Worship of God at Fairview United Church of Christ. It's good to be with you this morning. So let's open our service in prayer. Would you pray with me? Holy God, please be with us this morning. Send your Holy Spirit upon us to guide our words and our hearts. Be with all of those people who are at home. Be with all of those people who are worshiping with us. We ask, Lord, that you shine your light upon our world. We pray that you will help us to reach people for Jesus Christ. That this time of isolation will be an opportunity for us to seek new ways to spread the good news. Lord, if these little virus particles can do it, how much more can we do it? That you've given an intellect, you've given us a will, you've given us so many gifts for sharing the gospel. Help us to find the way to make your name known throughout the world. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Today's sermon title is Heartbreak Hill. We're going to talk a little bit about marathons. But first, our focus scripture comes to us from 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, I pray now that I may decrease, that you may increase, Lord, Make this all about you. It's not about me. Send your Spirit to guide our words, guide our hearts. We pray that you will open our ears to hear your word, your Holy Spirit, your teaching. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So Heartbreak Hill is the title of the sermon. And Heartbreak Hill is a hill in Boston. It's between Newton Center and Chestnut Hill, very close to where I went to seminary. When I was younger, I used to run it for exercise. I would run from seminary to Boston College and back. It's about a three and a half mile round trip. And Heartbreak Hill is not a heartbreaker if that's all you run. If you only run the three and a half mile round trip, it's not going to break your heart. It's only a heartbreaker if you've already run the 16 miles before that. That begins in Hopkinton, Massachusetts. That's the beginning of the Boston Marathon. The reason the Boston Marathon is unique in marathons is because the first 16 miles are downhill. And that may sound like it'd be easier than running uphill or on a flat surface, but it wears you out in a very strange way. It wears out the front of your leg, the quadricep muscles, because you're trying to stay upright. So then 16 miles in, that's where the hills start. And so then your front thighs, your quadriceps, are already fatigued from all of that work. And now they're forced to work in a different way, moving yourself uphill. And by that time, the runners have depleted their glycogen stores. So these are the, the, the food for the muscles. It's all gone by this point. And so the only thing that you can use to keep going are your... It's just, just sheer will. It's sheer it's willpower. It's grit and determination from that point on because there's no, there's no stores left. And this is what endurance athletes talk about when they talk about hitting a wall. You risk hitting a wall when you get to Heartbreak Hill. And by hitting a wall, they mean you just can't go any further. Your body says, nope, I'm done. Now, in this reading that we've just finished that... Paul wrote to Timothy, he wrote, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. This is the last letter that Paul wrote. He knew he was about to die. He would be executed by the Romans because of his belief in Jesus Christ. 
he also would have been very familiar with the story of the first marathon runners, the Greek messenger Pheidippides. In 490 BC, he ran from Marathon, Greece, to Athens to bring news of the Greek victory over the Persian army. This is why a marathon is 26 miles, 385 yards long. That's the distance from Marathon to Athens that Pheidippides ran in 490 BC. This was a legendary feat of strength, and it was unparalleled at the time, and no athlete was prepared physically for an endurance race of that kind. But for Pheidippides the messenger, his duty was to bring news of victory to Athens. And this was his reason for being alive at the moment. Nothing was more important, not his comfort, not his health, not his convenience. And of course, Paul, writing about 500 years after this, would have been very familiar with Pheidippides. He compares his life as a faithful Christian to the race that is run by that first marathon runner. You see, the Christian journey is not a 100-meter dash. It's not a 5K run. It's not football or basketball or baseball. It's not a team sport where we've got one team against another and you've got cheering fans and money and endorsements and, and celebrity athletes. Paul wants us to understand that being a faithful Christian is an endurance race that tests our minds and it tests our bodies, it tests our souls, it tests our faith, not just for a short time, but throughout our entire life. And nobody can run the race for us. If we hit a wall in our faith, nobody can run that race for us. In team sports, when one player gets tired, they can swap that player out with another player. Or in an obstacle race, other team members look out for a teammate that is lagging behind. But in a marathon, if you quit, that's it. If the runner gives up, it's over because it's just the runner and the trail. That's all there is in a marathon. Even though there may be thousands of people running alongside the marathon runner, it's up to the individual to run every one of those 26 miles, 385 yards. You know, that's about 33,000 steps for the average marathon runner. But that's like our world today with the, with the coronavirus. This is going to take some time, so our world is running a marathon alone together. We are alone together. Now, four-fifths of the way into the Boston Marathon, that is where Heartbreak Hill is. And by itself, it's just four-tenths of a mile long. It's a gentle slope in beautiful Chestnut Hill, Massachusetts. You know, it only rises 88 feet. That's less than a 4% incline. But after a long race, this can be the breaking point for the runner. This is the point where the only thing keeping you going is your heart and soul. It's not physical strength anymore. It's just sheer grit and determination. So what's your heartbreak hill? Is it COVID-19 coronavirus? Is it financial hardship? Is it a strained relationship with your loved ones and your family? Was it when a loved one died? Was it when a relationship fell apart? Is your heartbreak hill an addiction to substance? Is your heartbreak hill when your prayer wasn't answered? Or you didn't find the answer to the prayer that you wanted? Was it an illness? Is your heartbreak hill the memory of some terrible abuse of your body or your mind by someone that you trusted? For Paul, now his heartbreak hill was not being imprisoned. Paul's heartbreak hill was the people in the churches in Corinth and Colossae and Philippi and Thessalonica and Galatia and Rome. These were churches that he had helped get started. These were churches that were full of people that were messing up. They were bringing in their pagan practices they were trying to tell people that faith in Jesus wasn't enough. They needed to bring in man-made rituals of membership. 
And Paul could have given up at this point. He could have given up. He was in prison. He was isolated. He couldn't get to his church members. He would have had a very good excuse not to even bother anymore. But instead, Paul wrote letters. He wrote letters to these churches. He wrote letters, and because the Holy Spirit of God inspired Paul to write those letters of instruction to the Romans, and the Corinthians, and the Thessalonians, and the Philippians, and the Colossians, and even those foolish Galatians, as he called them, because they were anointed by the Holy Spirit, those letters have become part of the Christian canon, C-A-N-O-N, Christian canon of Scripture that we know as the New Testament. They have stood the test of time by the grace of God and by his own determination to remain faithful to Jesus Christ, Paul, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, wrote a big portion of the Holy Bible, the Word of God, through the words of the Apostle Paul. Imprisoned, he had every excuse not to keep trying but he persevered through his heartbreak hill. And by doing so, God reaches us today on March 29th, 2020, through Paul's very last letter that he wrote shortly before he was executed because of his love for Jesus Christ. Would you like to know how heartbreak hill got its name? Back in 1936, Johnny Kelly and Ellison or Tarzan Brown were the front runners in the Boston Marathon. Johnny Kelly was a native New Englander. He was a plumber and electrician, and he had won the Boston Marathon in 1935. Now, Tarzan Brown was a member of the Narragansett Indian tribe of Rhode Island, and his people nicknamed him Deerfoot because he was so fast at running. And he, Tarzan Brown had been in the lead for the first 20 miles of the Boston Marathon. But on that hill, between the 20 and 21 mile marker, between Newton Center and Chestnut Hill, Johnny Kelly overtook Tarzan Brown. And as he passed him on the hill, gave him a little pat on the back. Now there's a whole book about Tarzan Brown that was published in 2006, and it, it There's a whole chapter about that one little pat on the back from Johnny Kelly. Why did he do it? Some people said he patted him on the shoulder. Other people said it was on the back. Other people said that he just patted him on the backside. Was this a condescending thing that he did? Was he saying, uh, a nice job, kid. I'll take it from here. We'll never know. Whatever it was, though, Tarzan Brown later said if this little pat on the back was what renewed his spirit, it... It renewed his competitive drive. And so he rallied, he pulled ahead of Johnny Kelly, and he won the race in 1936. And the press claimed that this broke Johnny Kelly's heart, and they nicknamed it Heartbreak Hill. And the nickname stuck ever after. But you know what? Heartbreak Hill does not have to be the end of the story. Even though Johnny Kelly was defeated in 1936, he didn't quit. He went on, he kept running, he kept training, and in 1945, he won the Boston Marathon a second time. He also represented the United States in the Olympic Games in 1936 and 1948, and in his lifetime he ran 1,500 races, which included 112 marathons. He won 22 diamond rings, 118 watches, one refrigerator, and no money. He ran the Boston Marathon 61 times, and at age 84, in 1992, he ran his last full Boston Marathon. He was named Runner of the Century by Runner's World Magazine in 2000. He died October 8, 2004, at age 97. Now, Tarzan Brown, who defeated Johnny Kelly at Heartbreak Hill in 1936, died in 1975 at the age of 61. He was hit by a van outside a bar in westerly Rhode Island. You see, Heartbreak Hill for Tarzan Brown was just one victory in 1936. For Johnny Kelly, Heartbreak Hill became an opportunity to work harder, to grow stronger, 
and to leave a legacy that would inspire generations of marathon runners. There's a crown of righteousness waiting for all of those who can run through their heartbreak hill. Those who keep the faith even when the world points to defeat. Because the Christian journey is not us versus them. Whoever they might be. It's not about having political and economic power that we can subvert others. The Christian journey is a marathon race. And for each Christian, it's me with Jesus in my heart versus my heartbreak hill. That's the competition. It's not us versus them. It's me with Jesus in my heart versus whatever my heartbreak hill is. Nobody can run through heartbreak hill for us. But you know what we can be? We can be water stops for one another. Every two miles along the Boston Marathon are water stops. These are places where the runners can grab a quick drink of water or some Gatorade to replace lost fluids, keep their electrolyte levels up where they need to be. Otherwise, runners risk dehydration and hyponatremia, which is low blood salt. Runners have to stop whether they feel thirsty or not because during a marathon, the body uses up nutrients so quickly that it's faster than the thirst mechanism can kick in. And so dehydration, hyponatremia, low blood sodium, these things will happen without warning. And so the runners have to drink fluids whether they feel like they need it or not. This is what worship is. We've got to stop for worship whether we feel like we need it or not. It's like a water stop along the marathon trail and we have to avail ourselves of these worship water stops whenever they come our way. Because otherwise, the journey of life and faith will deplete us. Even if we don't feel hungry and thirsty in our souls, if we don't let God refresh us in worship and in immersing ourselves in God's Word, then we will suffer from spiritual dehydration caused by the lack of the living water of Jesus Christ and spiritual hyponatremia, which means we're going to lose our salt. Remember Jesus calls us the salt of the earth? And He says, if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? Matthew 5.13. So worship, like we're having this morning, even though it's in a little bit kind of a different way, worship is our spiritual water stop. We are watered and we're salted for service so that we can continue running the race, keeping the faith, and running through whatever our heartbreak hill is. We pray that this video and this worship time will serve to bring everyone who sees it spiritual nourishment, refreshment, encouragement, because we are all running this marathon. We're running it alone together. God bless you. This morning we have prayers to lift up. We'll lift up these prayers and then pray the Lord's Prayer together. So let us pray. Almighty God, we praise Your name and we ask for the gift of Your Spirit to pray in us and through us. Lord, our first prayer this morning is about the coronavirus pandemic. We pray for the end of this virus, that You would halt its spread. Help us not to spread it through our actions, or through the spreading of false information. Be with the researchers who are searching for vaccines and cures. Be with the manufacturers and people working from home that are sewing face masks, inventing ventilators, creating medical equipment out of everyday objects, everything from construction masks to baby diapers, anything to help protect the frontline workers from infection. Lord, we pray for those who are frontline workers those who are exposed to the virus every day. We pray also that you be with the men and women of the armed forces who not only face daily danger, but now their danger is compounded by the COVID-19 virus. We pray for the hospitals and facilities that are overwhelmed to sick people. Lord, in the midst of the chaos, let your peace be felt in the hearts of all those people affected, 
even and especially those who don't know You and those who don't believe in You. Lord, give those people an unshakable sense of peace and strength, a feeling of assurance that they've never felt before and they can't explain, and let that lead them to faith in You. When all this is over, let them remember that peace. That peace of Your presence that they felt that they'd never felt before. Let them remember that and say, it must have been God. And now I want to know Him more. We pray also this morning for families of those who have died and those that have to wait to gather for funerals of loved ones. We pray for those who are lonely and isolated, especially the homebound, nursing home residents. We pray for anyone, especially children who are trapped in an unsafe place. Children's or adults who are the victims of abuse or neglect or exploitation. Lord, we pray for Your supernatural protection over them. We ask for Your grace and peace to form a barrier of protection all around them. That You fill them with Your Holy Spirit and keep them from all harm. We pray for those people who have lost their jobs. Those people who don't have enough money to make ends meet. We pray for our leaders, our civil leaders, our community leaders, our educational leaders, our faith leaders, our national leaders, our world leaders, our family leaders. Fill them all with your wisdom. Take away all pride and foolishness from our hearts and give us hearts of Christ. Help us only to say the words and do the things that are in accordance with your will. Lord, we pray for the truth of Christ to shine upon the darkness of lies, that those lies would disappear in the light of Christ. We pray for people who are preparing for surgery or beginning cancer treatments or healing up from surgery or illness. We pray that you would speed their recovery. For those people who have addictions in this time of isolation, those cravings for substance are strong and there are fewer opportunities for accountability. So intercede by your powerful Holy Spirit for those people who are in recovery. Help them to stay strong. We pray for students and parents, all school personnel to have patience and strength, knowledge, energy, and whatever else they need to get through this new way of learning. God, we pray that we will all be back to normal, but that we never lose the lessons to be learned through all of this. We pray for those who are keeping the electricity on. Again, we pray for the service workers the doctors, the truckers, the construction workers, sanitation workers, nurses, nurse aides, volunteers, and so many others. We also pray for parents who are expecting in these times of uncertainty, especially those who have endured the loss of a miscarriage or are experiencing complications with their pregnancies. Fill them with health. Bless their unborn babies. Give them an unshakable sense of Your presence. Lord, these and all the prayers of our hearts we raise to You through the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I'm going to play one more piece now. I can't remember what it is, but it's right over here. In the sweet by and by.
Jesus called his disciples the light of the world. He said, you are the light of the world. Let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God. So let us go forth to let our light shine right where we are. Amen.